Thank you very much, Trish. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to, to have a short presentation tonight at this uh, digital UK hydrographic society meeting. Um, as, uh, as Trish mentioned, my name is uh, Charles de Jong. I come from the Netherlands originally. I have a uh, background in uh, GIS and cartography, and I've worked for many years at uh, Teledyne Caris in the Netherlands, um, where I got acquainted uh, with uh, hydrography, as it's uh, Caris is a software company that, that creates uh, applications for the processing and management of hydrographic survey data. So about a year ago, I moved to the Norwegian survey company Teratech, where I started working with uh, bathymetric LiDAR, which I think is a very interesting topic. Uh, this slide gives you a very quick introduction to, to Teratech and uh, the broad range of, of geospatial services that we offer. It is one of the biggest uh, geospatial companies in the Nordic countries, and Teratech has always been at the forefront of technical development. I work in the uh, airborne uh, LiDAR uh, uh, the urban data capture department, where we have many years of experience with urban LiDAR, both topographic and also bathymetric. In this presentation, I will focus on urban LiDAR bathymetry, what it is, how it works, uh, the types of equipment, uh, the new sensor that, that Teratech has, and I will also talk about two use cases. What is airborne LiDAR bathymetry? Well, it's a, uh, to summarize, it's a remote sensing technique for measuring the depths of relatively shallow coastal and inland water bodies with a pulse scanning laser from the air. And the technique actually is not new. Uh, it's already in the 1960s that the uh, US uh, U.S. defense uh, was uh, trying to use laser from airplanes to find uh, Russian submarines. So it's, it's really uh, a Cold War remnant uh, and using laser to, to find water bottoms uh, was commercialized in the, in the 70s uh, by, by uh, the company Optech actually to start with. And um, there have been other countries so Optech comes from Canada, but also the US and Sweden and Australia, they have been notably uh, involved from the beginning and, and mostly um, the, it, it derived from uh, defense projects. Uh, so the companies that, that work with bathymetric LiDAR uh, did assignments for, for defense projects or uh, are based upon them. To, to tell you something about the advantages that airborne uh, LiDAR bathymetry has, it is, of course, a very fast survey method. Uh, you can fly over an area with around 200 to 250 kilometers an hour, which is uh, certainly faster than you can survey an area with a boat, um, and faster than you can survey with a multi-beam echo sounder. Also, you have a constant swat width. Uh, so that is a specific advantage in very shallow areas where, for example, multi-beam surveys only have a very limited SWAT width. And furthermore, it is also a very uh, safe method for surveying in very shallow areas to reach with uh, a multi-beam sensor. Another advantage is that with bathymetric LiDAR, you can... Uh, also map the area on land with a high point density. So it gives you a seamless topobathymetric elevation model of the coastal zone, which is very difficult to achieve with other means. And in many countries, it is actually the coastal zone that is very important for, for many reasons. I mean, most people live in the coastal zone, so there's a lot of economic actors and, and value in the coastal zone. And specifically in this zone, uh, is where uh, airborne bathymetric LiDAR is of high value. Let's say in the zero to 10 meter depth uh, between uh, land and water. There are also some uh, limitations to, to bathymetric LiDAR uh, when you compare it, for example, with a multi-beam survey. 
because how deep you can reach with a bathymetric LiDAR is totally depending on the local water transparency and the turbidity, uh, the bottom reflection, and also the strength of the laser pulse. The, the best systems available uh, have the ability to reach about three times the visible water depth. So the range of depth you can reach with a bathymetric LiDAR, they vary enormously based on the mentioned variables from let's say a couple of meters in muddy and, and turbid waters to up to even around let's say 70 meters when the water is very clear and you have a strong laser and you have a good bottom reflection. So it very much depends on the survey area, but in general, a better metric LiDAR is probably most advantageous for coastal areas, while multi-beam, for example, as you can also see on this picture, is better for deeper areas. So these two survey methods are uh, complementary to each other. On this slide, I've, I've tried to do what um, cartographers do. I've tried to, to map the global airborne LiDAR surveys of the last decades uh, based on information that is available on the internet. And so all the dots in green are areas where airborne uh, bathymetric LiDAR surveys have been executed. And when you look at this, uh, well, rotating globe, I'll do it once more, you can maybe notice that most surveys by far have been executed in the, the, the Western world uh, and some countries, uh, let's say USA, UK, France, uh, but also Australia and, and, and South Korea, Japan, they have been at the forefront and those have mostly been the only countries that have been executing better metric LiDAR surveys. So I don't know of any surveys in, in South America or, or Africa for example. Um, of course, this is based on what is publicly available on the internet, right? And based on my research, so this is definitely limited, but just to give you an impression. And it also says something, it, it, it's only been done by um, organizations that are uh, have some money. Uh, it's, it's, it's a bit expensive uh, and are technologically uh, advanced. So it's mostly government agencies executing it. Uh, so better metric LiDAR is, is a bit of a niche market, a niche market within uh, hydrography, uh, but also within the LiDAR market, where topographic LiDAR is definitely uh, bigger. So what I did in this slide, I tried to uh, make a comparison between two types of, of uh, better metric LiDAR systems. The shallow water systems and the systems for shallow and deep water. So the shallow water systems, they usually have a quite a low laser power per individual pulse and a water depth penetration to one or two times the Secchi depth. That's actually, the Secchi depth is kind of the, the visible water depth. And they have in general, uh, a higher measurement rate and point density, uh, a smaller laser footprint and a smaller receiver against the, the, the shallow and deep water systems. Those are usually a bit bigger systems uh, with a stronger laser pulse. Uh, but if you have a stronger laser pulse, uh, you, can, you can reach deeper, but it's also uh, a bit less accurate and the number of pulses per second is also less. So it's a bit of a trade-off between point density and, and depth there. And also um, the, the weight. So uh, I've, I've got, I've got uh, an example of some systems. So uh, Regal is a, a Austrian um, manufacturer and they have, for example, the VQ840G, which is a relatively new sensor, which you can use not only in an airplane, but also in a helicopter and potentially also in a drone. So systems are getting smaller and, and lighter, um, but using a system in a drone, it, it, it's, it's an option, but you, it's still heavy, right? So you can't survey for more than 10, 15 minutes, and it's not a very stable platform to survey on. So that has some uh, effect on your data. Uh, when you compare it with some more uh, 
shallow and deep water uh, systems. We've got the uh, Leica is a uh, Swedish uh, uh, manufacturer uh, or uh, Hexagon Leica. Uh, they've got the Caroptra and the Hawkeye. And Teledyne Optec has the uh, the Seasmill Supernova. That's the the, the latest uh, release, and they they are systems that can reach deeper, up to three times the Seki depth, and uh, but they are also heavier, so they can only be used uh, in in an airplane. So, to tell a bit more about how it technically works, um, you from an airplane. TerraTech is using a, a Cessna caravan, which flies with a speed of about 120 to 140 knots, which is not very uh, quick for an airplane, uh, at a flying height of about 400 meters, uh, which is also lower than a, a topographic LiDAR survey. So you shoot from uh, the sensor a pulse a laser pulse with a wavelength of uh, 532 nanometers and also 1064. So that's green and infrared lights uh, from the LIDAR uh, to the ground with a frequency of about 5,000 to 500,000 shots per, per second, pulses per second. And that's depending on the, on the system that you're using. So I'm trying to, this is relatively generic. So when the light hits the water, uh, the infrared light is all of it is almost directly reflected, and that's usually that wavelength is usually used to find out where the water surface is. However, uh, the green light has a frequency that is uh, best able to to penetrate water. So some of the light is is uh, uh, reflected back, but some of the light is penetrating the water. In the water, it gets uh, the, the angle is refracted, so it's changing. Uh, the light gets scattered. It also gets absorbed. So many things actually happen in these nanoseconds before it hit uh, the, the, the the bottom. But if the water is transparent enough, and the laser is strong enough, and the bottom is not too deep, some of the light hits the bottom. It illuminates it and it reflects on it. And that is, again, if the bottom is, uh, for example, white and sandy, if, if, if there's dark mud, there's not a lot of light that is being able to be reflected. So uh, those are the kind of things that you depend on uh, when you shoot the laser pulse. So the light uh, reflects back through the water column and in the airplane, in the sensor, there is a, uh, a sensor that detects the uh, reflected light photons. And I think it's, it's worth to, to mention, and, and yeah, it still, still kind of amazes me uh, how fast light goes, right? Because uh, when you are used as a hydrographer to measure with, with sounds, uh, that, that moves with about uh, one and a half kilometer per second in the water, which is fast, but uh, light moves with about 225,000 uh, uh, kilometers per second in water, which is actually slower than true air, but it's still uh, many times faster than, than measuring with sound. So for one pulse to go out of an airplane and come back, that, that airplane has barely moved one or two millimeters. But still, um, the sensors in, in the LiDAR systems are very sensitive, right? So they uh, pick up the LiDAR photons that come back. They, they convert them to digital signals. They amplify them and they count the photons. And uh, you get, based on that, a, a waveform based on a pulse. And you see that in the picture here on the right-hand side. And so there's a range uh reflections from the air but then there is a return from the water surface after a number of nanoseconds the light continues in the water which is actually this part of the wavelength the waveform is also interesting because if there are objects of vegetation in the water you can also see that then the water bottom is hit and basically based on the difference in time you can compute the depth 
uh, we're based on advanced algorithms. So this is one pulse. But as said, there are, uh, depending on the system, let's say 10 to 500,000 uh, pulses per second. So there's different scanning patterns, but uh, this is uh, for our sensor, uh, scanning uh, circular uh, at this height of 400 meters. This is the SWAT width. And if you fly with around 120 knots, this is a resulting pattern of points on the ground. So uh, the Seasmail supernova that we have uh, has about eight points per square meter for the so-called shallow channels. It depends a bit on the, on the settings and the flying height and the speed, etc. But this is the result. And this is how you see actually in the Keras software, um, one pulse uh, and different waveforms. Uh, so one pulse has, has, has different returns. Some of the data is accepted, some is rejected. And here in these waveforms, you see the crosses, these crosses indicate the water surface. And here the other crosses are the water bottom. So you can check that data. So that's kind of the, 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 the principle. And of course, um, in the processing software, the uh, waveform information is combined with uh, navigation data from the GNSS systems and from the IMU systems. So it's the same a bit as with multi-beam. All this data is combined to find out the geospatial position of the data. Okay, I would also like to tell you a little bit more about uh, the sensor that uh, TerraTech has uh, recently acquired and it's, its history. Uh, it's the uh, Seasmail Supernova, and Seasmail stands for Coastal Zone Mapping and Imaging LiDAR, and it is one of the deep penetrating LiDARs with a powerful laser. The original Seasmail and uh, the, the Seasmail Nova were actually developed by uh, the US government and uh, Teledyne Optech for the National Coastal Zone Mapping Program. And currently these sensors are used by uh, the US Army Corps of Engineers, by the US Navy, and also by NOAA and other, uh, as well as other government mapping agencies around the world. So this is a map of the US uh, made by the US Army Corps of Engineers that shows that uh, over the years, uh, since they've used the, the, the Seasmail, uh, they've mapped almost the entire coastline with, uh, with this system and some areas, uh, multiple parts. So they've used it a lot. And I know that also the, uh, the US Navy uh, has been mapping about 25,000 square kilometers uh, over the world uh, in different areas. Uh, it's not, I don't know where exactly, but I know the amounts. And also just to put this a bit into context, uh, the US Army Corps of Engineers probably published a brochure last year about uh, the value uh, of this type of system to, to the nation. And uh, there they note that, well, using LIDAR bathymetry, they save per uh, mile of shoreline uh, many thousands of dollars and also time. And also, uh, I wanted to highlight that the data that you acquire or that they acquire in the US with the system is used for many different types of, of pur purposes, right? They use it for nautical charting, but also for geological research, for flood map mapping, for uh, storm modeling, uh, monitoring, and all kinds of other sorts of coastal zone management applications. So this really shows how uh, you, you collect the data once, but it has many different types of, of uses. So the Seasmail Supernova that has just been released now is an upgrade of this sensor system with uh, quite a few improvements. For example, uh, double the point density due to a higher uh, laser uh, pulse repetition frequency. Uh, it has, uh, of all potential systems, the best penetration of deep and turbid waters. 
the accuracy is improved and um, the, the shallow channels can reach up to IHO special order. Uh, what is also new is that there is Keras processing software uh, that used for the processing of the data. So this kind of leads directly into the uh, workflow that, that many hydrographic agencies and companies use. So that's, that's an added benefit. And also, um, well, it's, it's maybe good to mention that, that TerraTech, we are the first uh, commercial company that actually owns a, a seismic type sensor after uh, government uh, organizations. And it's also the first type of seismic that is now available in Europe. So to tell a little bit more about the uh, accuracies, uh, I won't go into all the details, but uh, Optech has published a uh, total propagated uncertainty model, which uh, takes into account the, the variables that influence the, the path of the laser as it propagates to the ocean floor, as well as all the individual uncertainty components. Um, so based on this, uh, the TPU for each individual laser shot is stored as an attribute of the point cloud data. So that's the same as with, with a lot of multi-beam data, you have the TPU, this is an attribute, that's, that's important metadata. Uh, and, and based on this model, um, you can also, uh, what I try to do here is, and I won't go into a lot of detail, but this is maybe interesting for hydrographers, uh, I've tried to compare the IHO orders of accuracy with the seismic accuracy. So this is the vertical accuracy. All the dotted lines are uh, IHO order 1A and 1B, uh, special order and the new uh, exclusive order in, in uh, the latest uh, IHO S44 edition. The same here for the horizontal accuracies. And what you can see, well, the topographic accuracy is, is, is here at, at, at zero meters. Uh, but for the shallow channels, the um, supernova uh, accuracy is equal to uh, IHO special order vertically. And horizontally, it is, it is better in the first, uh, uh, well, than special order in the first 20 meters and always better than order 1A or 1B. And well, Maybe it's good to mention here as well that there is a difference between the shallow and the deep channels. So the seismal supernova is both a, um, a LIDAR system for measuring shallow, uh, shallow areas and deep areas. So the, the shallow channels are um, more precise, but have less depth uh, that they can reach, while the deep channel has a bigger field of view that it looks at, uh, and it has a better depth penetration, but the accuracy is a bit less. So it's, it's, I mentioned before this, this trade-off, uh, and, and this system is, is, is two in one, shallow and deep. So that's why there's different channels. Also, maybe worth to mention that there is a high resolution, so uh, a high vertical resolution. And what I mean with that is that there is a digitizer that I, I mentioned it before that digitizes the photons. And the faster you do that, the better you are able to, to shape the waveform, the better you're able to, to, to measure, right? So there is two and a half uh, samples uh, for each nanosecond. So you have a very precise waveform, which in return allows you to do good detection of vegetation in the water or objects or other things. Uh, and this together with a short pulse width gives a good vertical resolution. Um, at the same time, when, it's, when you talk about the uh, IHO uh, orders, they also come with the ability to detect objects. For example, the IHO uh, order uh, 1A uh, says that you need to be able to detect two meter, uh, two by two by two meter ob objects up to a depth of 40 meters. Well, that is usually not a possibility with, uh, with a better metric LIDAR because 40 meters is usually too deep. Uh, 
right? But it is usually able to do this up to five meters, 10 meters, depending on the transparency of the water, right? So it's, uh, that's interesting also to, to, to look at. Let me then focus uh, finally about uh, at two uh, use cases with this uh, with the seas mill. So first, um, the use case first use case is a uh, airborne light bathymetry survey around uh, Stavanger in Norway. Uh, we actually uh, TerraTech just received the the sensor in April about a month ago, so very recently. But we already won a uh, Norwegian tender uh, to, to map this area. So we had to get started right away. And it's, it's an interesting project um, in itself. It's called uh, Marine Base Maps for the Coastal Zone, which is a Norwegian government cooperation between the hydrographic service uh, called Kartwerke uh and uh the geological survey and the norwegian institute of marine research and terratech will not only survey with bathymetric lidar but we will also use a very high resolution rgb camera as well as an hyperspectral camera and the aim of the project is to use new technologies to map the coastal zone in an efficient way and to get as much information out of the data as possible. Uh, so uh, this is like I showed in the USA, uh, the idea to survey once and use data for many purposes, uh, many different coastal zone products. Uh, so it's not only the elevation, but it's the reflectance, the, the, the what's the bottom, the, the sediments, uh, the type of vegetation, etc. So all these products are interesting for a coastal zone and for society as a whole. So this is a pilot project. And if successful, uh, then the idea is to use bathymetric LIDAR to map larger parts of the long Norwegian coast, at least those areas that are suitable for bathymetric LIDAR. And after Canada, Norway actually has the longest coastline in the world. If you include all the small little islands, there is a length of more than 100,000 kilometers of coast. So there is still a lot of work to do in Norway for mapping, because a lot of this area is not mapped too well. It's, it's not too accessible with, with multi-beam. So a requirement for this tender was to cover the zero to 10 meter depth area with a specific point density. And this is, again, the area that is difficult to cover efficiently with a multi-beam. So to prepare for this survey, we made an assessment of the depths we would probably be able to reach uh, with the supernova in this time of year. So as I mentioned before, the water depth that any LiDAR system can reach, a bathymetric LiDAR system, depends on the strength of the laser, but also on the local water properties. So transparent water with a high bottom rep reflectivity gives a higher chance of good returns. And there is a um, measurement value for water turbidity, which is called the uh, KD, uh, which is the uh, diffuse attenuation coefficient, uh, which indicates how much of the laser light will be absorbed by the water. So for every one divided by k, k meters you go down in the water, you lose about two thirds of the laser light. And as you can see here on this map, low KD values represent clean water and high values turbid water. And water gets usually turbid if there is a lot of sediment and, and particles in, in the water. So uh, as you can see, uh, most of the coastal zones are actually pretty turbid as well. So this is something that you need to, uh, to definitely take into uh, account. So for every uh, bathymetric LiDAR system, there is a so-called bathymetric performance uh, coefficient, which is basically the, the maximum uh, KD value uh, you can, KD max value you can, can reach. And that is, of course, a critical parameter for uh, these type of systems. 
So um, to prepare for uh, the survey in the Stavanger area, uh, we looked at satellite images. So the Sentinel, uh, ESA, ESA uh, Sentinel-3 satellites, they have a uh, sensor on board that's called the Ocean and Land Color Instrument. And you can, for free, uh, download uh, satellite data from days that there are no clouds, because otherwise you don't see anything. And you can extract from there uh, the KD value of an area at a certain moment. And as this is data that is updated on a daily basis, uh, this, is, uh, this is very useful information. So this is a sample screenshot of, of last year. We did some samples throughout the year and we saw that uh, around March, uh, the KD value around Stavanger is, is 0 0.12, which is, which is quite good. But it, it definitely throughout the year goes up and down. And this has most to do in this area with, for example, uh, algae that are blooming or not. So that, that has a lot of sediments coming out or in. So that has a lot of influence. And another thing we did to prepare, which is of course related, is we did actual SECI depth measurements. Uh, I mentioned SECI before, you, there is a, a SECI disc, is a disc of, of 20 or 30 centimeters. And you basically, uh, what you do, you lower this in the water and you see into how deep you can see the disc. It's, it's, it's basically pretty simple. Uh, and that's what you measure. And of course, when the water is clear, you can see the disc to a dip, deeper depth than if the water is not clear. So we did measurements uh, on the 27th of March, 15th of April, and the 25th of April. And we saw actually pretty big differences, right? And, and this is, as I mentioned, uh, might be related to, to the algae bloom or, or a, a storm, or we're not exactly sure, but we were pretty lucky because we did our first survey actually on the 25th of April uh, when we had a lot more uh, visible depth than the days before. And if you compare here, uh, this is the diagram that is basically uh, comparing uh, different KD values. So this is very dirty water, dirty, typical type of water, uh, up to clean and very clean water. And the red line is what a typical SECI depth measurement would give you. So if the water is, is dirty, it would give you 2.7, uh, 10 meters depth when it's typical. And then here you see uh, the green, these two green uh, lines. This is the shallow channels and the deep channel uh, of the supernova. This is the maximum depth it can theoret theoretically reach, depending on the survey modes that you use. Um, but as we uh, found out that uh, based on satellite measurements and SECI depth measurements, that uh, this is the approximate uh, SECI disk depth in this area, we expected depth of, let's say, uh, 25 meters to, to maybe 30 uh, because we use the so-called shallow mode. We wanted to focus on the shallow area. So the maximum de depth was a bit less. One thing to note here again is that this is depending on good bottom reflection. If you have less than, let's say, 15% bottom reflection, if you have a dark and muddy bottom, you will not get uh, these values. So that's a caveat here. But in any case, from theory to practice, um, we, we just... Of course, as I said, we just got the stand, so we just uh, did the survey. So we just got the data to our office and we're still processing this data, but I did manage to create a quick screenshot out of it. And I must say that I was very impressed with the way the data looked. We have a lot of data uh, and uh, the tender requirement was to have data up to 10 meters depth, uh, but the data we have shows shows a consistent coverage to at least around 20 meters deep, uh, including areas that are deeper than 30 meters. So uh, I think this is the um, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 meter depth contour you see. 
So I, as said, I was pretty uh, pleased with this and, and that kind of proves that uh, the seasonal supernova can in practice deliver what the theory says. So that's, that's basically preliminary conclusions for this use case. The other use case and last one that I wanted to, to talk about uh, is a uh, survey, uh, an airborne light epitometry survey that Terratech has executed uh, together with the Climate Impacts Research Center of Umeå University, which is a university in northern Sweden. This one was actually not uh, executed with the Seismal Supernova, but with the predecessor, the Seismal Nova, which we had borrowed for, from Teledyne Optech to test the system's uh, possibilities before uh, moving forward. And I wanted to share this as I think it's, it's, it's an interesting use case and also a bit different than, uh, it's, it's a bit different than a regular bathymetric survey. So, uh, accurate uh, bathymetric data collected from lakes is important for large scale models that capture uh, the climate and the carbon cycle interactions, such as the so-called earth system models that are used by the IPCC, which is the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And at this moment, uh, the regional and global modeling does not account for uh, the carbon cycle of lakes. And that is because we do not have accurate bathymetric maps on a global or, or even regional scale. And that highlights the uh, importance of understanding uh, lakes in, in climate and carbon modeling. And, and especially, of course, in, uh, with the climate change that we're facing. So what um, Umeå University wanted to do was to survey uh, a mountainous area in northern Sweden, which is full of lakes. You actually see this in the picture. Uh, but it's, it's a scarcely populated area. There's almost no roads and the area is pretty inaccessible. And doing a survey here with multi-beam, all these lakes, that would be very time consuming and, and if at all possible. So the idea was here to try to survey the area with better metric LIDAR. And uh, we knew in advance that the lakes here are quite transparent. Uh, so we had good hope to get good results. And we covered about uh, 50 square kilometers, 34 flight lines, and we did actually reach depths of 20 to 25 meters. And this was indeed the result that our contact person, Mr. Uh, Christian Gudas, he was very happy with this. So I've got a few screenshots here. Uh, you can see here the topography of the area, the water surface, as well as the, the water bottom. Uh, so we reached in these lakes quite a bit, not, not where it was deeper than, let's say, 25 meters, but still there is a lot of data that's that area that is covered. So you see here a zoomed in picture with a uh, point cloud, uh, including also the, the vegetation, because the LiDAR system is both a topographic and a bathymetric LiDAR. So it also gives a very good uh, picture uh, of, of, of the uh, topographic side of things. So here is a same picture with a uh, bathymetric grid. And here is a similar kind of picture where we have overlaid a autophoto over the topography and the bathymetry. And we do Terratec always when doing a survey, a bathymetric LiDAR survey, we always include um, high resolution RGB images. So uh, the new camera has about 150 megapixels. So that gives very good images that also help a lot in the classification of the data itself. So the conclusions for this area was that uh, airborne LiDAR bathymetry has provided actually some spectacular results uh, in these Arctic mountainous lakes. Uh, at least this is the conclusion from, from Umeå University. And also that, yeah, this is probably the most efficient way to, to, uh, to survey these type of uh, lakes uh, in these type of areas. And what the hope is that 
potentially uh, this type of project can be extended to other uh, areas and, and help with the understanding of lake bathymetry around the world, which can in turn help with uh, understanding uh, climate and carbon cycle interactions. So to conclude this presentation, uh, with airborne lighter bathymetry, large areas can be surveyed efficiently, specifically when you compare it with a multi-beam survey and different types of products can be created based on the data. With the uh, seasonal supernova, TerraTech has a valuable and, and top-notch bathymetric LiDAR system in-house. It's uh, an upgrade of the system that has been used and trusted for many years by, uh, by US and other government mapping agencies. And it's, it's kind of the, the latest and greatest in, in bathymetric LiDAR. And we are, TerraTech is happy with the uh, initial results that we have. And, and also the earlier tests that we had, for example, in Northern Sweden were very positive. So we, as TerraTech, we uh, are able to deliver a full so survey solution. Uh, we, we execute the bathymetric survey, we do the data processing, and we are able to deliver high quality geospatial products according to IHO or other requirements. And we're basically ready to deliver these services and looking forward to use this sensor to survey in other waters as well. So if you have any questions or remarks, you are free to contact me by phone or email or LinkedIn. I would be happy to discuss further and um, also happy to, to take questions if there is 